You think about these two phrases, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. What do these two phrases have in common? Well, both are encouraging cheer. They're encouraging us to be joyous and to be happy or to be merry. You think about the song, have a holly jolly Christmas. It's the best time of the year. I don't know if there will be snow, but have a cup of cheer. Now, of course, that's speaking to probably strong drink, but it's also talking about being joyous and having cheer. You hear these types of phrases all the time around the holidays, and rightfully so. But at Christmas time, there's also a great sense of loss. There's a great sense of isolation, and there's a great sense of loneliness that is heightened by Christmas itself. I want to give you some stats this morning. First stat I want to give you is this. 61% of Americans felt lonely in 2019. 52% sometimes or always felt alone in 2019. In 2018, that number was 46%. 47% of Americans sometimes or always felt that their relationships were not meaningful. 21% have no close friends. 58% said they sometimes or always felt like no one knew them well. And 49% sometimes or always felt as though they lack companionship. These statistics are mainly from 2019, and I did that deliberately because these are statistics that are pre-pandemic. So if you can think about these statistics and then multiply them because of everything that's happened in the world in the last two years, you get a lonely, lonely world. Amen? So many people feel alone. In Scripture, we see this all the time. You think about the scene you just saw. How often have you thought about Mary and how isolated she must have felt? First virgin in the history of the world to conceive, right? That had to be a lonely feeling. The isolation she experienced, the ostracization she felt from her family and friends, from the community around her, she would have been labeled. She would have been alone. A single pregnant girl in that time could be stoned for such an offense that was brought against her if it was. Mary was just one of the many instances, one of the many people in Scripture that felt this loneliness. Joseph was betrayed by his own brothers and thrown into a pit. He was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery, slavery, and he was 30 when Pharaoh promoted him. And for at least two years, he was in prison, alone. Moses was alone. He led millions of grumbling people. In Exodus 16, 2 through 3, we read of this account. It says, And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You see, leadership often is lonely. If you ever want to be a leader, if you have ever led in a significant way, you will realize that it is a lonely place. You think about the prophets and their message to the people. What was their message? Half of the time, most of the time, their message was repent. Stop doing the things you're doing. That can isolate you very quickly. That can make you feel very, very lonely. And we see in the scriptures it often did. You think about David, a man that the Bible says was a man after God's own heart, but yet he was constantly alone. He was on the run. Even with his mighty men of valor, David often felt alone, and he expresses that in the Psalms. You think about the Apostle Paul. You think about how many times he felt alone. We're going to look at that today in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 18 for context just to make sure we understand what is happening in this scripture. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. That's when it's popular and when it's unpopular. 
He says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Does that sound familiar? That is the day and age that we live today. Verse 4, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to miss. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now these two, next, these two verses next are very, very important. Verse 6, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Now, Paul is saying these things because he is in prison facing a Roman tribunal. He's about to face possible execution. Verse 8, In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to also to all who have loved his appearing. Verse 9, Make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Princess has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. And at my first offense, no one supported me. But all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. Verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask that you bless this word. We ask that you take it and... Drive it down deep into our hearts. Lord, help us to hear what you want us to hear. Help us to glorify you in response. Help us to live differently because of it. Help us to be more like Christ. and Help us to see you in it all. We thank you and praise you for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The question I want to propose this morning is, how do I overcome loneliness? How do we overcome loneliness? Now, you might say, I'm not really alone right now. Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But number one, above all, the way to overcome loneliness is to acknowledge that you will experience loneliness. (laughs) You have to come face to face with it and confront it. I will one day experience loneliness. Paul, in verse 16, says no one. How many people is that? Zero. No one supported me or stood with me, but all, that is everyone, deserted me. See, denial never helped anyone overcome loneliness. A lot of people say during these times, I'm okay, I'm fine, everything's all right, and we move on with life, but Paul doesn't do that here. Time and time again in this passage and all throughout all of his writings, Paul is very open and forthcoming about his isolation and his loneliness. We see in verse 10, he says, For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me, gone to Thessalonica. Crensus has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. He's naming people that have abandoned him. He's not shying away from saying, I'm alone here. I'm standing on my own. There's nobody left. Everybody has left me. I am feeling very lonely. See, everyone experiences loneliness. And there's three tenses to loneliness. You have been lonely. How many of you can remember a time in your past where you have felt extremely alone? Raise your hand real high. If we're honest, I think all of us have. When I was in my 20s, all the way from my 20s to my 30s, I was not married. And I was alone a lot. And I felt that loneliness as I saw my friends in college begin to marry, begin to find spouses, It highlighted and accented that loneliness. Christmas and the holiday season can do that as well. It can remind us of our ever-pressing loneliness. So maybe you can remember when you were alone, but also you will be alone. At some point in your life, you have to face the fact that you will be alone. Even in a crowd of people, you can feel alone. Amen? 
even in your own family, you can feel alone. See, I'm older than my wife by a substantial amount. I'm not going to tell you how many years older I am than her. And I often used to joke about what would happen if I passed first. I often used to say, likely, what are you going to do for the last 20 years, 30 years of your life when I'm, when I'm gone? I don't joke about that as much anymore because I've seen it happen in this church. Just being real and honest with you. I've seen folks pass away and their spouse left behind. And I hurt for that person. And I think about those people often around Christmas time. Because if you've never experienced loneliness, you have to understand that you likely will one day experience loneliness. It's a heartbreaking thing to lose someone. There are no words that a pastor can say to someone who has lost the love of their life. And as Christmas time comes this year, I hope that as a church we would reach out to these folks. Amen? That we would be Christ to them in their loneliness. Maybe right now you are alone. These are the three tenses. You have been alone. You will be alone. Or maybe you are currently alone. Right now, feeling extreme loneliness. See, the two greatest causes of loneliness is death and divorce. And I can't even begin to fathom the depths of the heartache that some are feeling this morning as we enter the Christmas season, as Christmas Day comes and goes. And it's just the nature of things, isn't it? This is the effect of sin in this world and yet we think about why Christ came you see you might think right now why is he not talking about the baby in the manger why are we not in the chapter 2 of Luke why are we not talking about the Christmas story listen we very much are <laughs> because our God put on flesh and bones so that he could he could be with us in our real life situations this includes your loneliness and my loneliness. It's not just those who have lost people. Listen to me, those of you who have lost people this year, the last couple of years, just because you've lost someone, there are people around you who feel just as alone, and yet they have a spouse. They have a family, but their family doesn't know them. Their family doesn't love them, and that can, that can highlight the isolation in their life. And as the church, it's our job, it's our responsibility, it's our privilege to come around those folks and love them during this time, during this season. We must face the fact that we have been alone, we will be alone, or we are presently alone. See, help from the Lord begins when we acknowledge our loneliness to the Lord. The disciples, the people who have wrote the Bible, you see the humanity. You see their realness. You see their hurt and their pain and, yes, even their loneliness. We must acknowledge it. A brilliant doctor by the name of Dr. Seuss, tell me if you've ever heard of him. <laughs> he had a way of saying profound things in simple ways, didn't he? This is what he said, all alone, whether you like it or not, Alone is something you'll be quite a lot. Isn't that true? It's true. And it resonates with us. We must face it head on as Christians. We must confront it and acknowledge and accept that at one point in our lives, we will deal with overwhelming feelings of loneliness. But it gets better. There's good news. Secondly, number two, believe that God has a purpose for your loneliness. There is a reason for this pain that you're feeling. Verse 17. What did Paul say was the reason for everything he was going through, including his loneliness? He tells us. He says, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. What is he talking about? It's very clear he's talking about the gospel. Don't ever forget the gospel at Christmas time because that's what Christmas is about. That Christ came to us, that God became flesh, and he lived a life that we couldn't live. He grew up to die on a cross to pay for our sins so that we could have eternal life. That is the gospel in a nutshell. Amen? 
And your loneliness, your pain, your suffering can help others not feel loneliness, pain, and suffering as we point ourselves and others to the gospel, knowing that is our greatest purpose and our greatest plan in this life. Amen? Amen. If you're struggling with significance this morning, understand that God's goal for you, first and foremost, is to know him through his son, to trust in him, to believe in him wholeheartedly, to acknowledge that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and that he died on the cross for you. But also, it's to tell others of that good news. See, we must trust in the plan and purpose of God in this season of loneliness. Now, most people at this point would say that's easy for someone who lived 2,000 years ago to say, but Paul really doesn't know what I'm going through. But look at verse 13. Paul says in verse 13, when you come... Bring the cloak which I left at Troas with you. What is he talking about? Why does he want a cloak? Well, he's in a cold, dark, dank prison completely alone from his friends, from his family, from anybody that cares about him. Paul is feeling this isolation. So Paul can relate to every single thing you're going through in terms of loneliness. Why would God, though, allow us to experience the depth of our loneliness? can be so painful sometimes. Why would God allow this to happen? Well, two simple reasons I'd love for you to write down. Number one, to draw you to himself. That's number one. To draw you to himself. Number one, for those that don't have a relationship with God, God allows suffering in your life to push you towards him, to trust him, to believe him, to, to make him or allow him to be king of your life, to come into your life, Right and save you, and also to Christians to push you closer to him. Everything that happens in our lives is used to sanctify us, to make us more like Christ, and to help us experience the love of Christ in our deepest, darkest days. It's to draw you to himself. See, God's best for yourself is himself. It's not money. It's not the house. It's not that job. It's not whatever you think it is other than Jesus Christ himself. God's best for yourself is himself. And God will do whatever it takes to bring you to a place of decision about your relationship with him. Even allow you to experience extreme loneliness. See, sometimes God strips us of everything and everyone so we will realize that he is what we really need. So he allows this loneliness to draw us to himself, but he also allows it, number two, to draw you back to his purpose for your life. As we get older, we begin to lose and forget about our dreams that we had when we were young. Or maybe when we first became Christians and there was a fire in our heart about what God wanted us to do. His ministry for us. You've heard the word ministry? Say amen. Amen. Ministry means your service. It's how you serve God, and God has specifically gifted you as a believer to serve God in very special and specific ways that he has entrusted to you and given you talents and given you desires and given you passions and given you all these things and all these resources within you that when you walk in the Spirit, you will serve him through. And God has a purpose and a plan even for this isolation, for this loneliness, and he wants you to use it. He wants to draw you back to his original plan for your life. If you're alive, God still has a plan for you. Now, here's what we run into in our church, because we're an older church, present company excluded. Amen, Gunner. We get into this retirement setting, and we get to this retirement age. Before we know it, we're trying to do little things here and there. We're trying to fill in the gaps of our lives, trying to make up time and just fill the time. And before we, we know it, we've forgotten why we're here. And we're just piddling around, collecting seashells on the seashore. How great is that? Nothing wrong with collecting seashells on a seashore, but God has a bigger purpose for your life, whatever your age, right here, right now, than just relaxing and calling it a day. There is still work to be done. There is still a plan for you. Raise your hand if you're alive. The people that didn't raise their hand, I totally expected that. I I knew that was coming because you don't act like you're alive. If you're alive, God has something for you. 
Get excited about that. Think about that. Pray about that. Ask God, what is it that you want me to do in this time of pain and suffering and isolation? You still have a plan for me. Believe that because it's true. But it's something that you choose to believe. You have to choose to believe that in the middle of this, this hurt and this pain and this isolation, in the middle even of your loss, you must choose to believe that God's not done with you yet. He's not done with you yet. He's not done with this church yet. He's not done with me yet. Amen? Amen. And as long as we have breath in our lungs, we must believe that God has a purpose and a plan for this loneliness. Thirdly, we must commune with our family. We must commune with our family. You want to overcome loneliness? It means you must commune with your family. Verse 17, Paul says these profound words. But the Lord stood with me. Young people, listen to me. There's going to come a day when you're going to need somebody to have your back and nobody's going to be there. Either by physical distance or they just abandon you or you feel like no one is there and the only one you will be able to turn to that is still there with open arms is Christ. He'll be there. He's waiting for you. He'll stand with you, just as he stood with Paul in his time of isolation. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. See, when we feel like there is no one who can identify with us, when we believe there is no one who understands us, when we believe there's no one who knows who we are or what we're going through, we experience an intensification of loneliness that is Almost unbearable. You know, that's one of the major things I hear when people go through grief. It, it feels, even though they know other people have lost loved ones, it feels like you're alone because it seems like no one else could experience this pain and this hurt that I'm experiencing right now. Feelings, feeling as if no one knows us, no one understands us, and no one can empathize demoralizes us to the point that we feel lonely. Even in a room full of people, we feel lonely so disheartening loneliness, it can even lead to thoughts of suicide. It's no surprise that that is on the rise, not just thoughts of suicide, but suicide itself, even amongst the church. I remember several years ago, the church down the road heard of a deacon who took his own life. You think, how could a man of God do that? It's because these things are real things. We can't just Look the other way as a church. We must confront, confront these things head on, especially during these times, especially during the Christmas season. To commune with your family is a vital aspect of overcoming loneliness. What does it mean to commune? Maybe that's a word you haven't heard in quite a while. To commune here, when we talk about commune, we're talking about sharing together. We're talking about sharing our time, sharing our Talents, sharing our money, sharing our tables with one another, our food, having meals. We're talking about conversations. We're talking about being vulnerable. We're talking about opening up our hearts to one another, right? I think we're pretty good at that as a church for the most part, but we can get better. And we can come out of, listen, listen to me, listen to me. We can come out of our little groups that we always flock to every Sunday morning, and we can go to the people that we don't know and begin to ask them, how can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? And those who come into this church should always feel like they can just open up their hearts and be honest and be real without judgment, without condemnation, and that we will be listeners and we will be lovers and we will be Christ to them. How do we do this? How do we overcome? How do we conquer loneliness by communing with our family? Well, number one, if you like to write this down it's in your notes I must have consistent communion first of all with my father my brother has a great relationship with my dad and I have a great relationship with my dad too but my brother still a single guy so he calls my dad every day and talks to my dad almost every single day my dad loves it and I love talking to my dad as well and I think about that communication there and how vitally important it is to keep that connection with my parents. And no matter what your situation with your parents, whether they're alive, whether they're past, 
whether it's a good relationship or bad, you can understand how vitally important it is to have a good relationship with your Father here on earth. If that's true, imagine what it must be, mean to have a good relationship with your Father who is in heaven. To talk with God on a consistent basis. To be vulnerable as if you know He knows everything already, but He wants to hear it from you. You see, to commune is to practice intimate communication of your heart and mind with God. To commune with God involves two basic, here's a dirty word in our culture today, disciplines. And in the church, we've, we've said, oh, we don't need disciplines anymore. That's legalism. No, it's not. Disciplism actually enables grace in our lives. We, t- we are to have discipline in our Christian life basically in two main ways, and you probably already know them. Number one, by prayer. Paul was a man of prayer. He had a real, authentic, personal, daily relationship with the Lord through constant prayer. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, this is what he says. I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my what? Prayers. How often? He says, night and day. Now, does that mean we have to pray literally every second of every day? No, we've talked about this before. It's a mindset. It's an attitude. The the, the ongoing conversation you should have as a Christian is one with God. Constantly talking to God in your mind. Constantly communicating your heart to the Lord. Prayer is vital, a vital discipline of the believer's life. To commune with your Father through prayer will begin to help you overcome loneliness. That's a pretty basic thing, right? I think it was Spurgeon who said, when you don't feel like praying the most, pray doubly. Because it ticks the enemy off. And it helps with the loneliness You see, I don't have anybody to talk to. And this is not a trite thing, folks. Talk to the Lord. Not in in flowery, oh, thou art our Father, oh, thou God. No, pour your heart out to him. He can handle it. He can can talk with you as you talk to him in, in broken vernacular, in broken whatever, however you speak. God just wants to hear from you, and he also wants to speak with you, which is the second discipline, the word of God. We commune with God through prayer and through his word. Verse 13, Paul says, when you come, bring the cloak, because he's cold. But what else does he say? Look, when you come, bring the cloak, which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. What is that? That's the writings. That's the word of God. He's saying, bring the word of God. I need the word of God in this place. In prison, I need the word of God. See, for healthy communion with God, you need both disciplines. You need prayer, and you need the Word. And listen, you need them consistently. Consistent prayer, consistent reading and study of the Word of God will help with any feelings of loneliness and isolation. Secondly, we said I must have consistent communion with my Father. Secondly, I must have consistent communion with my brothers and sisters. I have a great relationship with my family, my brothers and sisters, my siblings, I wish I was closer to some of them. We talk on the phone and kind of just give each other the details of what's going on in our lives. And I'm excited, especially when my sister calls, because she's growing in grace, and she's just come so far in the last couple of years in terms of her her relationship with Christ. And I know she doesn't care that I say that, because, man, anybody that knows that and has gone through that, as I have, that's growing in grace in Christ, knows that it's the best thing that could ever happen to us. And there's nothing that should make you more happy and excited than seeing your family members grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen? As we see that, as we feel that, we want that in our lives as Christians with one another. In verse 11 of 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. See, Paul is understanding here the importance of fellowship of brothers in Christ. Of people that truly, genuinely love him. Of a person he could call in the middle of the night if Paul broke down and say, yeah, that guy will be there for me. That's what we need as Christians. But it needs to be gospel-centered, Christ-centered, Christ-focused. You and I were built for gospel-centered fellowship. Fellowship that centers on, listen, not food, not church, not music, not anything other than Jesus Christ himself. 
My prayer for 2022 is this. God, make us a church that longs for Christ. That wants Christ above everything else. Because if that happens, we will love our neighbors in our community. If that happens, we will serve one another in this church. If that happens, joy will come. Fellowship will come. Unity will come. No matter what happens in the world around us, if we trust and press into Jesus Christ, if we make him everything, if we make him our greatest heart's desire, all those things will come. The psalmist said in Psalm 119.63, he said, I am a companion. What is a companion? Partner. What else? What other words? Companion. Friend. That's what we're talking about. He says, I am a companion. I'm a partner. I'm a friend. Of who? Of all that, of them that fear thee. That is, respect the Lord. Those people that love God. You should be a partner, a friend, a companion of those who fear, love, respect God. And of them that keep thy precepts. The people you should be drawn to the most as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, are the people of God. Christians, people who walk in the word, people who desire to be here. I read a, a great quote. I kind of want to read it to you. i got to find it real quick. This is Jordan Easley. I don't really know. He's a pastor. I don't know him too well. But he said, if you're a Christian that loves the Lord and has a healthy, growing relationship with God, you shouldn't have to be begged or convinced to go to church on Sunday. And he said this, hunters hunt, runners run, shoppers shop, workers work, worshipers Worship. I don't want to embarrass her. Miss Linda this morning started crying a little bit because she was so happy to be here. Amen. That should be the mentality. That should be the heart of the believer. To be in the fellowship with other believers. There's nothing like it. There are people that get together because they've been in wars together. There are people that have been together because they've been on a football team together. There are people that have... They come together for all these various reasons. There is no better reason to come together than Jesus Christ. Amen. Should this should be this way for us. Our truest and deepest friendship should be among those who are fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Dakota Lynch said that. See, this is not a ploy to get you to come to church consistently. Don't ever come to church out of guilt. Actually, do come to church out of guilt. <laughs> but try not to let that be the reason you come to church. Parents with your children. Sometimes, yes, you have to drag them kicking and screaming. And my parents did that too. And guess what? I heard the word of God. And it paid off. This is not a ploy to get you to come to church consistently. This is a plea. Are you listening? Say amen. This is a plea for deep, abiding community. Community like the communities out there don't know. Community that will last forever in Christ's kingdom one day. It is a special thing to be prized and to be, to be looked at as a privilege to come together as the body of Christ. And listen, it will push out loneliness. Amen. See, we have techified, I made that word out, we have techified ourselves into isolation. Cell phones, Facebook, Texting, all these things have led to a less personal society, right? And, and I'm not against those things. Those things are good things. I think they can be used for the Lord. Do you know what the loneliest age group is? Generation Z, ages 9 to 24. It's the tech, the tech age, the tech world. They grew up with it. They know it. But it's, it's, it's creating this detachment. This is why these people, these are the same people that are saying, I, I don't feel like I have any real meaningful relationships. I got 1,002 followers on Instagram, but man, I don't really, I can't talk to anybody. Nobody really knows the real me. And obviously it's not just relegated to that one generation. All of us feel this way. Psalmist says, I am a companion of all them that fear thee and them that keep thy precepts. Let me ask you, who are the most influential people in your life? If I had to guess, I'd probably say, number one, it's family. And I think it should be. God, 
your family, blood, and then the blood of Christ's family. One, two, three. This is how we should be living as Christians. Charles Spurgeon said, Believers are not compared to be lions or bears or other animals that wander alone. Those who belong to Christ are sheep in this respect, that they love to get together. Sheep go in flocks, and so do God's people. Amen? J.C. Ryle said, How could that man enjoy the meeting of true Christians in heaven who takes no pleasure in meeting true Christians on earth? See, God has purposefully and beautifully given you a church family so that when your earthly family leaves or passes, you are not left as orphans. If we are to overcome loneliness, we must have consistent communion with our Father and with our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. The last thing that I want to mention, number four, that we must do to overcome loneliness is to declare our future. Declare your future. This is not a name it and claim it thing. I'm not saying speak it and it'll come into existence. I'm just looking at what Paul did and saying, I think we can do this too. Look at verse 18. If you're tracking with me this morning, say amen. Verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, one day, believer, I'm talking to believers, one day you will never feel alone again. That's hard for me to even fathom. One day you will never feel alone again. Again, and if you're an unbeliever, the only thing you will ever feel for all of eternity if you are separated from Christ is complete and utter loneliness. That thought devastates my heart. How many of you have relatives you know that do not know Christ? Raise your hand. More so than the pain of hell, more so than anything else, the isolation, thinking about them not having contact with loved ones, not having contact, of course, ultimately with God just crushes my spirit. And yet God has done something about it to where we never have to feel loneliness again. He said, in this world, you will have trials. You will have tribulation. You will have loss. He himself experienced loss. He himself experienced loneliness. Amen? And yet we have a hope that exceeds this world. What a reunion that day will be. Amen? We used to sing this song in church. My sister started singing the last time we were together for Thanksgiving. Old Bible Baptist church, man. They were a bunch of Bible thumpers, and it was a good thing. <laughs> they had a lot of grace, too, but they would always sing, When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. I mean, they would get loud like that. And they were excited about heaven. And I think as, as believers in this current day and age, we, we've forgotten that we have something to come. And Christmas reminds us that Christ, God, came to us. But it should remind us, too, that one day we will go to God. And we will see one another again. Listen, it's not going to be the same. And it's not going to matter. There will be no more marriage in heaven. There will be relationships, I think, will be, they won't be different. But I think it will be just such a pale in comparison to knowing and being with Christ. That's what's going to happen in heaven. And it's something we should just prize and look forward to. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. You see, we don't have to wait till heaven to shout the victory. We can declare victory even now over everything we're going through, even loneliness. We will see our loved ones. I saw something online that said, Who's the first person that you're going to look for when you get to heaven? That's a good question, right? And I haven't experienced some of the loss that you guys have experienced in terms of family and friends. I've experienced loss, but probably not as grave a loss as you have. And, and most of the comments were my dad, my mom, my dad, my mom, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter. Christ is there in your pain. He's there in your loneliness. He's there in your isolation. I don't say this tritely. I'm not preaching at you. But I think if we will search 
and press into Christ here and now, the first person we'll want to see in heaven will be Christ himself. Amen. Running to him, embracing him, loving him. And listen, listen to me. He promises that now. You can have that relationship now. You'll, he's not saying you won't ever not feel lonely. He's not saying you won't feel isolated. He's not saying you won't feel pain and suffering and hurt. He's saying he'll be there with you in it. You see, we have this hope of seeing Christ one day and of being with Christ even now and him being with us in our hurt, in our pain. It doesn't always get removed. It's just that something else is added and that something else is a person and his name is Jesus Christ. You see, we have this hope only because of Christ. In Matthew 27, 46, it says, In about the ninth hour, this is Jesus on the cross, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is in that? Loneliness. Imagine being in perfect fellowship for all of eternity past, and suddenly, abruptly, you're disconnected from him. The human mind, I'm not going to begin to try to explain this, okay, because I can't. That God could separate from himself in some way that he would feel isolation and loneliness to the point where he felt forsaken by God the Father. But it happened nonetheless. And it happened for a purpose. It happened for a reason. Jesus allowed himself to be forsaken by his Father so that you would never have to be forsaken by God. This is what we have as believers. And we should declare it. We should tell ourselves, I have a hope. Listen to Paul's words again. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. He's not talking about getting rescued out of this situation. He doesn't think that he's going to come out of this thing alive. He thinks he's going to be beheaded. And yet he still says, the Lord will rescue me. How, Paul? Well, he tells us, he will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We can praise God. We can give him the glory just like Paul did in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our loneliness because we have a hope that extends beyond this life. And as Christians, we must get back to that in our lives. Men, we must begin to lead our families and our homes thinking about what is to come, not just the here and now, not just everyday things that are practical needs, which are real needs, but we must think eternally and we will see the suffering and the pain of this world not leave, but be addressed head on by Jesus Christ himself as we make him the priority of our lives. So what's the application? Well, we sang about part of it this morning. We sang Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us, right? That's what Christmas is about. It's not just a baby in a manger. The baby in the manger was God in the flesh. God with us. Listen, God is still with us. Even though Jesus died and rose and went on to heaven, he's coming back. But in that interim period, he promises through his spirit to be in us and with us right now. Amen? He's with you in your heartache. He's with you in your pain. He's with you in your loneliness. He's with you in your suffering. If you will but reach out to him He's waiting for you with arms wide open. This is, the, this is the practical side of Christmas. It's that God is here. He is with you. Do you believe that? Now remember, some of you aren't going through a lonely time right now, but you will. And you must remember that you can press into Christ all because he came. Over 2,000 years ago, put on flesh, lived the perfect life, died on the cross for your sins. And if you will simply trust in his work, not your own good works, if you will put your faith in him, he will come and reside within you by way of his spirit. And you will never be alone again. Amen? Amen. Four things I want to give you practically to live this out. Number one, ask the Lord to reveal his purpose and plan for your life. Just ask him. These aren't on the screen, so you have to just listen and just, just ask him. You're 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7, 8, 9. Did I get everybody pretty much? 60, 61, 62, 63. You still got time. 
You want to know God's plan? Ask him. Secondly, discipline yourself in prayer and in the word. This is how we commune with the Lord. Discipline yourself. Ask the Lord to reveal his plan and purpose and then begin to ready yourself to hear his plan by prayer and being in the word. Make it a daily thing. Every morning, 7 a.m., spending 15 minutes with the Lord. Every evening, 7.15 p.m., 15 minutes with the Lord. Bookends of your day. I'm going to speak with the God of all creation. I'm going to invite Christ to walk with me step by step in my life. Make it a discipline. There are, there's nothing that should come in between you and God in those times. See, as we get older, what happens? We get in these habits and we're like, I don't have time for that. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And we miss out. And later in life, it comes back to bite us because we get lonely. And then we think, why isn't God here? What have you done for the past 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? Have you fostered that relationship through the the reading of the word of God and through prayer? Thirdly, commit to investing in your local church family. I mean your heart, not money. God doesn't need your money. Neither do we. I don't have any qualms about saying that. We really don't. God has provided way more than you guys could ever give. Because God does it. So what we want, what I want for you, and what God wants for you, is he wants you in fellowship. He wants you in relationships. He wants you in community, opening your heart, being vulnerable to one another. Commit, 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 make a decision. I always have a a weary feeling about people like, I'm not going to do that. If that's what you're asking me to do, if you're asking me to go to one-on-one, that's... I mean, I want to come to church and listen and be a spectator. And those are fine. We'll take fans. But Christ wants disciples. Christ wants followers. Christ, Christ wants people who are going are to sacrifice for one another. Commit to investing in your local church family. This isn't the church. Find a church. As long as it's a Bible-believing church, go there, get involved. Number four, reach out. See, this is not all about you. Despite what our commercials tell us and the radio tells us and everybody else tells us, Christmas is not about you. First and foremost, it's about Jesus Christ and his glory. But secondly, it's about other people. Who do you know that is hurting this Christmas? How about we reach out to them? Amen? How about we be Christ to them in their time of heartache and suffering and pain and loneliness? God will richly bless you for it. Emmanuel, God with us. God is still with us. God is with you.